Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to our Ultimate General series, uh, looking at the Battle of Stones River. This was taken from a uh, Let's Play a few days ago, or live stream a few days ago. Uh, but we're returning to that series, and we're going to be looking at the final day of the Battle of Stones River. We've so far uh, extricated ourselves from a near-crushing flank assault. We've withdrawn north and repulsed all the enemy assaults against us thus far. And now we're swinging out to the final day's fight of the Battle of Stones River. We have our forces in very heavy entrenchments uh, and also some troops across the river on the other side there. Uh, so with that being said, guys, I hope you enjoy this series. This is all taken from a live stream, so I'm going to go ahead and jump back into the commentary. This particular live stream has some interesting discussion around various Confederate commanders, James Longstreet being one of them. So I hope you enjoy it. It's a little bit more uh, historically themed and historically relevant than I think uh, a lot of my other live stream videos are in terms of the commentary. So I'll shut up and let you listen to that and hope you guys enjoy. Offensive. There's no doubt about that. But his weakness was that he was completely incapable and unwilling to fight uh, or per, or fight aggressively to prevent his line from being flanked. So literally, Sherman could just, could just go up and around him every single time, and with relatively little opposition, he was always forced from his positions. So yes, he would get into a really good defensive position, but he didn't. He it wasn't strong enough where he wasn't capable of preventing the enemy from just going around it and flanking him so that he had to retreat. Sherman just basically went up and over his left every single time throughout the whole Atlanta campaign. And he just kept retreating without really putting up much resistance during the Peninsula Campaign. And then when he attacked at Five Forks, I believe it was, uh, during the Peninsula Campaign, it was a, a mismanaged, dodgy affair. He just was unwilling, and, and I understand that Lee was probably too aggressive uh, on uh, for the Confederacy, but Johnson never would have put up a fight, and they would have lost the entire Confederacy and, and their ability to support a, a uh, industrialized army. So there's got to be a balance there. There's got to be a point where you can set up a really strong defensive position, but that you're also willing and able to attack. Uh, Joseph, or James Longstreet had a somewhat unsuccessful campaign in Western Tennessee or Eastern Tennessee as an army commander, but at least his skills are kind of ideal to what the Confederacy needed. He was very good on the defensive. There's no doubt about that. But you can see at the Battle of Second Manassas, for example, his ability to launch a attack as devastating as, as anything uh, Jackson could uh, put together. So he was kind of, in my view, the prototypical of what the Confederacy needed, uh, but I don't know if he was well suited to Army Command. Okay. All right. Um, and from the south, we basically expect the enemy to attack us everywhere. We must protect the Nashville Pike. We must protect the Nashville Pike. We must protect the Nashville Pike. Okay, I get it, guys. We must protect the Nashville Pike, right? All right, let's get these guys out of their entrenchments over here because we know the enemy's going to attack us over here. Okay. It's like a, a basketball chant. We must protect this house. All right. True Warner, but a lot of generals were proven during the Mexican-American War who ended up being tremendous failures during the Civil War. The Mexican-American War was a very different type of conflict, and, you know, a commander could establish himself as kind of a hero of that war, commanding a force of maybe a thousand men. And, uh, you know, in the Civil War, if he was given ten times that many men, he would fail miserably. Tony uh, Albert Sidney Johnson also fail, had a failed defensive strategy around the river forts. I, I'm not saying he was a bad commander. I don't think he was. But he didn't have a ton of actual successes in the six-plus months that he was in command that you could point to to say he would have been a brilliant, you know, success for the Confederates. I think he would have been better than Bragg, almost certainly. But I'm not convinced Albert Sidney Johnson was some hero that was lost uh, for the Confederacy. I just, there, there's very limited evidence to support that he would have been a very good theater or army commander. Even at Shiloh, he left a lot of details to his subordinate in uh, Pierre Touton Beauregard, Beauregard uh, that he probably never should have 
I mean, the, the overall arching strategy once the battle began, he kind of let Beauregard run the battle as he was kind of going across the front and trying to inspire the men. He was undoubtedly brave, but I wouldn't say that's the wisest... You know, if you look at Lee, Lee didn't, in general, until later in the war when he kind of had to, you didn't see him, in general, riding up front with his men uh, and, and getting in the thick of things. He generally gave an overall guidance of the battle, told Jackson and Longstreet what he wanted them to do, and then gave his subordinates great flexibility to, to accomplish that, however. Uh, but Johnson didn't even do that. He kind of left a lot of it to Beauregard. I wouldn't say the Confederacy had no chance. I don't subscribe to the lost cause theory. Um, it certainly, odds were against them, but there were many wars where a, a uh, opponent had lesser odds than what the Confederacy had, and in which case they won. Um, maybe the way the Confederacy fought the war, they were uh, not giving themselves the best chance possible, but there were there were opportunities there for the Confederates to win. Okay, we can see here there's a lot of troops coming up our right flank. Just kind of fast forwarding a bit because it's kind of dragging. There's no major attack going yet. All right, here we go. Uh, Forrest was definitely a great, uh, ignoring him being a horrible human being, which is certainly true. Forrest was definitely a great, a great commander of cavalry during the Civil War. I think it's it's to be seen if he would have been an effective commander of large bodies of troops, but he was certainly a master of uh, um, unconventional warfare. Sure, that's true, Marshal. Lee had been a little bit more conservative during the Gettysburg Campaign. It's certainly possible things could have turned differently. I don't know if it would have, uh, you know, I think a lot of the generals in in the Civil War era were trying to create a con A uh, to, to mimic the great victory of Hannibal. I think they may have been, you know, following some flawed principles in how to do that in this kind of a war. Why is the enemy marching on the bottom of a ridge? That's just weird. Weird movement there. And wow, that was a surprisingly effective volley for guys... Why are they getting so much cover? Like, their volleys shooting upwards are more effective than ours shooting down. That's bizarre. Okay. I think most of the enemy attack was spent yesterday. All right, nothing major going on over there. Most of the major fighting seems to be going on over here. And we could put cavalry in our rear. We'll see what happens here. It's a wheeler over there. What guns do these guys have? Springfields? Maybe that's why they're not as effective. Okay, routing them, putting them back. Pushing them up against the river. Drive them to the river! Okay. Maybe, but I don't think Southern mentalities were well suited to uh, even consider a guerrilla warfare. I mean, it happened in Mississippi, but Southern sensibilities were not that of, of bushwhackers during this period of time. I think by the time that they were maybe willing to consider it, uh, I think their moment and it had probably passed. 
There were limited areas where it worked and was effective. There were parts of West Virginia, for example, uh, or Virginia, which which bought into the ma that mentality. But in general, I don't think, you know, outside of some of the backwater areas, I don't think they were really all that well mentally supportive of the idea. They sort of had this idea in their head of being the noble, you know, the noble warrior of, of I don't know if it's fair to say the noble warrior of God, but... Um, they certainly had uh, different sensibilities when it came to, to war, warfare. I'm not sure they would have accepted being guerrillas. On, on the whole, you know, certainly limited soldiers in certain areas. I think mobile infantry had a little bit more of a willingness to consider it. Okay. You working on your MBA, Hong Kong? I'm actually just finishing mine up. I have one class left. I actually just found out that I work with someone who uh, was the project manager at EA on The Sims 3 for their uh, PlayStation and Xbox um, releases. Which, you know, I know a lot of people here probably aren't big Sims fans. My my sister used to play it all the time. I actually enjoyed the original Sims quite a, quite a bit. So I, I just found it out the other day. It's like, wow, that's kind of cool. And he has an MBA. He doesn't have any technical training. He was doing, again, he was doing project management, I think. I think that's my understanding of it. So there's a lot of things you can do in gaming that don't necessarily re revolve around coding. There's a lot of project managers. There's a lot of other roles, which are more traditional business roles that... Um, you know, an MBA would, would train you for very well. Yeah, Master, but I wouldn't... Longstreet was great on the defensive. He was also very good on the attack. He had a... Uh, one of the... Probably the most powerful attack of the entire war was launched by Longstreet at 2nd Manassas. He also shattered the Union Army when he came onto the field at the Wilderness. So he has a reputation of being a defensive-minded general... Uh, some of that is because of, you know, what happened in the Gettysburg campaign and some unfortunate slander that kind of grew around his, um, you know, blaming him for the loss there. Um, but he was also very good on the attack. I haven't tried to order order any movements using the divisional command button. I, I didn't know how effective that was. I haven't really given it a go. I think Longstreet's opinion in many people's eyes was kind of salvaged by um, Killer An was it Killer Angels, the book that the movie Gettysburg was based on, uh, which kind of made him one of the key characters. Uh, that really, I think, changed a lot of people's public viewpoints of like, hey, wait a minute, this guy, you know, he seemed like the wise warrior, like the, you know, why didn't we just listen to him? Um, but for years after the war, he was vilified by Southerners. It also didn't help that he joined the uh, Grant administration when Grant was president. I believe he was the ambassador to Turkey. And Southerners kind of viewed him as betraying the South and the cause uh, because he was willing to accept defeat and uh, join the, uh, the Unionist government. That's cool, Matt. Um, I've got a friend who does some Rev War reenacting. I don't reenact myself, but he really enjoys it. Actually, his wife does it too. That's how they met. Okay. So, driving them back here, we're almost into their fortifications that they've established over here. I don't know if I really want to attack that. I think we'll want to stay out of range of that. Especially because they've got some pretty good sized brigades behind those fortifications. Oh no, we're in range!
I, I know I'm not really looking at the main defensive position over here, but the enemy's not really doing anything on our left flank. It's just this engagement over here on the right. It's almost like a little mini battle within a battle. Kind of weird. Okay. Yeah, and I love how the Confederate cavalry is just sitting out like, oh, you could probably attack these guys in the flank, but rather than do that, let's just hang out here and do nothing. <laughs> they could hurt me. I've got enough manpower I could probably relatively... I mean, all I'd have to do is face Tor Tolbert toward them right now, and they'd be fine. But yeah, the AI is kind of being stupid. And again, no serious, no even probing action here on the left. Or we were expecting the attack. Okay. All right, they actually finally wore down some of our troops. Okay, we'll advance him. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe they realized they couldn't win anymore. Maybe that's why everything kind of calmed down a bit. These guys mostly are, are my inexperienced troops, so even just getting them a little bit of combat, they're taking some casualties, but, you know, getting them a little bit of experience might be useful. I don't know, we'll see, now that they're running out of ammo. I don't even think I have any ammo wagons that have anything left in them. Our artillery's shooting over here, but that's about it. Come on, second... Tyler Webb? What? There's no shooting over here! God damn it, he got hit by an artillery round, it feels like. What a waste. Alright, there you go. Now they can shoot into these guys' flank and rear. Oops. And the uh, defensive fortifications fall apart really fast when you got an enemy on your flank. As we showed, it's at Fredericksburg where we just obliterated the Confederate army there. Alright, um... Let's fast forward this up a little bit. Okay, we broke their line. They're kind of on our flank though, so they've recovered a bit. So even though our guys are low on ammo and firing at a reduced rate, the number of units we have is helping to offset that. See here, we're driving these guys from the field, kind of catching them in a bit of a vice. Tobert's kind of the anchor of our flank. This one brigade here, this enemy brigade, is pretty strong. They could, could have done some damage to us. I think now it's probably too late. Plus the, the AI is not mo maneuvering aggressively at all. Tolbert's wounded! Victory! So after 16,000 casualties at Fredericksburg, we lost 11,000 here. The enemy lost over 25,000. The enemy lost just shy of half their force. We lost a little bit less than one-seventh, or a little bit more than one-seventh of our force. Uh, bloody battle nonetheless, and uh, victory. If we go and look at the officers, we can hear, see here several generals were promoted. William Nelson to Major General, Charles Hines to Brigadier General, Joseph Hooker, Randall Henry, Patrick Kelly, uh, Harvey Wright, all to 
Major General. Lieutenant Colonel Datimus Latimer was promoted to full colonel. We've got another Major General in Sidney Cooker. Hector Tobert was wounded. Um, we've got a th our first three-star general, three, first three star general is George McClellan. A John Gibbon, also promoted to lieutenant general. Unfortunately, yours truly is somehow commanding the army, but remains a major general. Uh, and Major General Tor Tory Webb was wounded. So we lost one colonel wounded, one major general wounded, no one killed. This was a very good uh, battle for our officers, getting some experience. Uh, 11,000 casualties on our end. We didn't capture or rescue anywhere near 11,000 of our own guns. We did capture quite a few pattern 1853 Enfields. That's basically two regiments right there, two brigades right there. Um, and a few Lorenzas and M&Js. Overall, we're going to have to spend some money replacing you know, those uh, casualties because we, we definitely didn't get enough back to cover our losses. We did get 13,000 recruits that we can pull from, so that does mean we can replace our losses and have a little bit left over, not much. We got a little bit more than a quarter million uh, dollars to play with, two more career points to uh, improve ourselves, and you can see here we are now on to, what battle is this? The Chancellorsville uh, battle. So we're on to the Chancellorsville campaign. Uh, we have three smaller battles that take place before it, Two in the North, or North Carolina air region. Actually, these we were talking about General James Longstreet. He was the Confederate commander during this campaign, uh, which was reasonably successful, but, but didn't drive the Union from sort of these coastal areas in North Carolina. And then we've got the battle, a supply raid battle, and then we've got the major battle of Chancellorsville. So we've actually got three minor engagements, which will all take place before Chancellorsville, and then Chancellorsville itself. So that's really good in my opinion because it means we've got chances to earn a little bit of money, hopefully limit our casualties, and use that money to build our, our force up uh, to, to be a bit larger. Actually, let's take a look at Chancellorsville first uh, before we look at rebuilding our commanders here. You can see here we're going to need three corps, which we have, a rear guard, a center, and a vanguard. Uh, it would be nice to have a fourth corps to act as a reserve. Uh, we will see what we end up having uh, by the time we get there. I'd like to have a fourth corps. It might just be better to have a new division, though, within our, our existing corps as well. Uh, if we go back here, do we get any perk? There's no carryover perk for Stones River, uh, but if we do, uh, you know, win these other battles, we can reduce the, uh, the quality of weapons that the enemy has. So we're in 1863. We're still chugging along. We're still victorious everywhere we go. Just look at that string of victories. Um, and yeah, I think the next one will give us in the larger brigades followed by another corps. So if we put both of our career points behind army org, we could get a fourth corps chugging along, but we may wait and do that after one of the secondary battles. Cause I don't, I'm not going to have the manpower after this battle to really do that. If we go and look at government here, we can still get some Springfields. We can actually get some Burnsides, which is a breech-loading carbine of the finest quality. I think it's the finest breech-loading gun before you start getting to the repeaters. If we go into the armory here, we can see here, uh, do we start to get any of these better weapons? We've got a select number of Colts and Henrys. Not enough really to build any kind of sizable unit. Same for Spencers. Um, we're starting to build 1861 Springfields, I think. I think that's starting to be built. We've got 1,200 of them available. Um, actually, are those in the shop or are those just can't recaptured? So 17 in stock. So yeah, we're starting to produce these. So we've got 17 in stock, but then we can buy some from the shop. So that's good. We're starting to get better weapons there. Um, so yeah, overall, I think we're in pretty good shape. I'm going to wait to... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and save the game here. I'm going to wait to rebuild the army till our next video. So we've been streaming for a little bit over two hours now. So I'm actually going to go ahead and wrap this stream up. Hope you guys enjoyed. In our next battle, we'll look at re-equipping our forces, giving our core commanders uh, their final, you know, tick up the... Uh, up the promotion ladder, giving him that additional trait. That's too bad myself. I'm still a little bit of ways away from that lieutenant general rank. Uh, but anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. Nice little lively discussion in the chat. And uh, thanks for the new followers as well. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.